what is up everyone welcome back to my youtube channel today we will be reacting to one of the videos that you guys suggested when i was reacting to the netflix nascar full speed series um and it's called there will never ever be another driver like dale earnhardt i really hope i pronounced that right but yeah one of you um suggested this along with a couple other videos that you guys have requested i react to um if you do have any requests just drop them in the comments and i will make sure that i get through them i do just want to quickly say i am overwhelmed by the um support i got during my reactions to the nascar full speed series i really didn't know how it was going to go because i obviously don't watch nascar um so i didn't know because i know when drive to survive came out a lot of people were annoyed at like fans that got into it through drive to survive because you know it is very dramatized and people had a lot of mixed opinions about it so i didn't know how people were going to take to me who obviously hasn't seen nascar um watching it but everyone has been so supportive everyone's been dropping so many lovely comments um so i just want to say a big thank you to everyone who has been watching those reactions it's definitely made me want to make more content about nascar as well so i'm excited to do that um but yeah let's get into this video but before we get into the video make sure you subscribe over half of you that are watching my videos aren't subscribed so just go hit the subscribe button it literally takes two seconds a few moments later right let's go in the last episode of this series, I talked about the appeal of professional wrestling, a form of entertainment that disguises itself as a sport. In this episode, I'm going to talk about NASCAR, a sport which tries to disguise itself as entertaining. Today, NASCAR's Monster Energy Cup Series tours around the country racing in front of mostly empty arenas as sponsorships and television ratings continue to wane. There's one driver in the sport's turbulent history that truly embodies all of the reasons why NASCAR was, at one time, the second most popular sport in America. Okay. This is the story of Dale Earnhardt. Okay, bring it on. Many of my viewers like to draw comparisons between me and a writer by the name of John Boys, and it's a pretty fair comparison, considering John Boys is one of my biggest inspirations as a creator today. Last Halloween, John wrote a short story about a pitcher who sells his soul to Satan and falls away from the earth in the middle of a baseball game. Oh. While this story is clearly a work of fiction, it is eerily comparable to the real life and death of Dale Earnhardt. Our okay. story begins in the rural American town of Kannapolis, North Carolina. Sometime in the late 1960s, a young Dale Earnhardt drops out of high school and uses what little money he has to start competing at locally sanctioned dirt track races. Earnhardt most likely shares the same lofty, unobtainable pipe dream as all of his competitors to work his way up the ranks and eventually race in the top series of NASCAR. NASCAR, like Dale Earnhardt, had its origins in the rural American South. The roots of the sport can be traced back to the Prohibition era where moonshiners, attempting to smuggle barrelfuls of illegal whiskey, would tune up their cars to be able to outrun police. When Prohibition ended in the 1930s, the smugglers were left with nothing to do but race each other. That's Small, iconic. Small, unsanctioned races began to take place all across the South, but Look perhaps at the cars. no other place became a more popular racing love destination it. than Daytona Beach, Florida. The beaches of Daytona okay. feature finely grained sand that forms a hard, compact surface ideal for auto racing. It's a style of racing that started to become wildly popular in the American South. And perhaps no other man was more responsible for the rise of American stock car racing than Bill France. Bill okay. France was a fan of stock car racing since the days of his youth in the roaring twenties, where he would skip school to drive laps in his parents' Model T. When the Great Depression struck, Big Bill would flee to Daytona with less than $100 to his name, but he was able to stay afloat by racing cars on the beach. Wow. Eventually, Bill France would transition from race driver to race promoter, and on February 21st, 1948, he revolutionized American motorsports by founding the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, NASCAR. Before NASCAR, stock okay. car racing mostly featured scattered cool. and disorganized events with inconsistent rules. With yep. no major governing body to sanction races, there was nothing stopping some promoters from just not paying drivers the winnings they were owed. Oh. NASCAR changed all of this by organizing a unified schedule of racing events, complete with a singular rule set, championship point system, and guaranteed driver winnings. NASCAR truly became the first legitimate stock car racing league in America, and all of a sudden, 
the allure of earning fame and fortune through a life of racing began to attract drivers from far and wide. One of these drivers was a young Ralph Earnhardt, who in 1953 started racing full-time in NASCAR's Sportsman Series. Ralph Earnhardt's talent on quarter-mile dirt tracks made him a regional racing star in the Carolinas, and even wow. won him the Sportsman Series Championship in 1956. And even Go though on. he would use his racing talent to single-handedly lift himself out of poverty, he surprisingly didn't wish the same destiny upon his son, Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt saw his father as his greatest inspiration, and he saw racing as his only real ticket to success. Ralph Earnhardt didn't want his son to race, despite his own talent in the sport. Hmm. Talent is a very rare thing. If everyone were talented, no one would be. Ralph Earnhardt probably knew that's this, a and fair if he had point. His way, Dale Earnhardt would have quit racing to graduate high school and get a nice desk job in the big city. He probably never expected his son to become one of the greatest drivers ever. He never oh. lived to see it either. Oh. Just 20 years after he began racing full time, Ralph Earnhardt died of a heart attack. Oh. Dale Earnhardt could have followed his father's wishes, and if he did, he'd probably still be around today. But instead, he chose to follow in his father's footsteps. And in trying to bumps. prove to his late father that he belonged in a race car, Dale Earnhardt would accidentally become one of the best in the world. Just six years later, he found himself at the crossroads of history. Covering a city block a second. Daytona Beach. Traffic, take a look at that. Earnhardt blazes back into the front of the 1979. Even at the very beginning of Dale Earnhardt's rookie season in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, his talent was undeniable. For a moment, he found himself leading the 21st annual Daytona 500, which may have been the most important race in the history of NASCAR. Ten years later, Bill France would build an even bigger one in Talladega, Alabama. And while Talladega Super Speedway would also go on to be very popular with fans, it would not displace the Daytona 500 as NASCAR's crown jewel event. And that's why in 1979, CBS elected to broadcast the full race live in front of a national audience. It would be the first live broadcast of an entire 500-mile motorsports event in the history of American television. Wow. NASCAR found itself in a perfect storm of circumstances, quite literally. As on the day of the race, a blizzard left most of the eastern U.S. stuck indoors with nothing to do but watch the Daytona 500. An estimated 15 million viewers tuned into this race, and for a brief moment, some of them got to see an unknown driver by the name of Dale Earnhardt leading the race. While his father dominated on short tracks, Dale Earnhardt would find his greatest success on the big ones, even though they would also provide him with his greatest turmoil. He didn't know it at the time, nor did anybody else watching, but Dale Earnhardt was cursed. This is the story of a person and a place, a racer's relationship with a racetrack. This was merely the first chapter of Dale vs. Daytona. Oh. Earnhardt would go on to finish 8th out of 41 drivers in this race, not bad for his very first attempt at NASCAR's most That's coveted true. prize. Dale Earnhardt's rookie effort would be reduced to an afterthought, however, as everyone's attention was instead drawn to perhaps the greatest finish in the history of NASCAR. Let's all come down to this. Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. Ooh. Wow. Just took each other out there. And here comes a $60,000 car becoming a 22 passenger school bus to bring his crew to Victory Lane. And there's a fight between Kelly oh. Arbor and Donnie Allison. The Teppers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. In just a matter of minutes, the television audience got to experience dramatic racing, a crash, an unforgettable last lap pass, NASCAR's most iconic driver setting an unbreakable record, and a bare knuckle fist fight, all on live TV. All of a sudden, the what more could you regional want? <laughs> sport of NASCAR found itself with a national audience. The finish made it all the way to the front page of the New York Times sports section, and NASCAR would never be the same. The 1979 season saw Dale Earnhardt capture his first career win in just his 16th start. 
He would win the Rookie of the Year award for that season and go on <laughs> to finish seventh in the overall standings in a year where Richard Petty won his seventh and final Winston Cup championship. At this point in time, Richard Petty is unanimously regarded as the greatest driver in the history of the sport. Looking at it today, his career statistics seem almost mythical. Petty's 200 career victories are almost double the next driver on NASCAR's all-time win list, and his seven series championships were, at the time, more than double any other driver. After the 1979 wow. season, the mere notion of any other driver challenging Petty's throne as the greatest of all time was laughable. But if anyone were to do it, it would have to be a driver the likes of which no one had ever seen. Where Dale Earnhardt in car number two is currently the leader. And he is on his way to victory and hopefully to pick up some additional points as he is on his way in his sophomore year to a national championship. In 1980, Dale Earnhardt shocked everyone by winning the Winston Cup Series Championship in just his second full-time season. Only the 15th different driver to achieve the title of NASCAR champion. Already in his young career, Dale Earnhardt had joined some elite company. But he would soon learn that even when you're great, you're still a long way from the best. <laughs> Although he began with one of the greatest starts to any career in NASCAR history, Earnhardt's car owner Rod Osterlund would unexpectedly sell his race team midway through the 1981 season. Oh. Earnhardt reacted poorly to this transition and struggled for the next few seasons while bouncing from owner to owner. After going winless in 1981, Dale Earnhardt had the worst statistical season of his career the following season, oh. finishing the 1982 campaign with an abysmal average finish of 19th, while failing to finish more than half of his races for wow. the year. After such a promising beginning, Earnhardt's Winston Cup career had slammed straight into a concrete wall. I'll tell you, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. When you do that in a hot car, oh, oh we've got trouble in turn one. Look at that, two automobiles. That's Dale Earnhardt in the Wrangler jeans machine. One of Earnhardt's oh. 18 DNFs for the season resulted from a violent crash at Pocono that sent his number 15 Ford skidding on its roof down the embankment of the first corner. The accident would fracture his oh, kneecap, but it wouldn't stop the scrappy Earnhardt from racing the very next week at Talladega, where he would suffer another hard crash. Oh. This was surely the most trying time of Earnhardt's racing career. When faced with the lowest moment of his career, Dale Earnhardt did what he always did. He waited for an opportunity and pushed forward. Fuck you, buddy. Going to never back down, never what? <laughs> Oh, go on. 1984. Of the 1984 Talladega 500. This man, Dale Earnhardt, is successful. In 1984, Dale Earnhardt found himself with a new owner, Richard Childress, and a new car number, three. He would stick with both of them for the rest of his career. Under Childress, Earnhardt's career would immediately begin to rebound, and it would mark the beginning of his finest era. By 1986, Earnhardt would be champion once more, becoming just the 11th driver in history to win multiple NASCAR championships. In 1987, he had the best statistical season of his career, wow, what finishing the year with 11 wins and his third cup championship. And after third. this dominant season, Earnhardt would return in black, embracing <gasps> his new role as the Intimidator. Earnhardt would make frequent use of the bump and run, a racing tactic bump where a driver run. uses the inertia of their own car to move other drivers out of the way and advance their position. It's a maneuver that's Smart. practically unheard of in open wheel racing because it's really only possible in a series like NASCAR. Yeah. Even within NASCAR, the bump and run is still a highly controversial move. It, you can't racing do that in F1. <laughs> consider it a dirty tactic as it detracts from the skill of outlining your competitors. Mm. Other fans view it as a valid and necessary part of stock car racing, considering it's a viable strategy that's not against the rules. Your outlook of this issue most likely determine whether or not you were a fan of Dale Earnhardt, as his frequent use Fair. of the bump and run quickly made him one of the most polarizing drivers in NASCAR, and his notoriety would only grow as he became one of the most oh. dominant drivers in the sport. For many drivers, nothing was scarier than seeing Dale Earnhardt in your rearview mirror. If you saw the number three Chevy behind you, you would either get out of his way, or he would make you get out of his way. <laughs> God. For many years, Earnhardt was NASCAR's greatest heel. It's not fair, and they try to race nice and clean. And you know, the thing of it is, you go out and you run as hard as you can all day long, and then him trying to cut you out to outrun it, that ain't the way I was brought up racing. I guess what they were insinuating, don't go run into Dale Earnhardt. If you weren't an Earnhardt fan, it was probably very easy to hate him. 
because there was mm. a good chance you could recall a time when you wrecked your favorite driver. Oh. Despite Earnhardt's tendency to enforce his will upon other drivers on the track, he certainly had his fair share of supporters. Although Dale Earnhardt remains one of the most memorable NASCAR drivers to this day, he was never the most popular driver. That distinction belonged to Bill Elliott. You know, the okay. thing of it is, I have been not the aggressive most driver. Most popular all driver. My life. You know, I've tried to give and take with the best of the things. But when a guy cuts you off, that's He withdrew bad, his obvious, name because he wanted other to drivers other to team. win. Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, Georgia, was because in many he won ways that many a times. Wow. Dale Earnhardt. He, too, came from a racing family and rose to prominence in the 80s as one of NASCAR's best. The soft-spoken and humble Elliott contrasted heavily with the outspoken and brash Earnhardt. Bill Elliott would set NASCAR's all-time speed record, 212.8 miles per hour. Go on. For comparison, the pole speed for the Indianapolis 500 that same year, the fastest open wheel race, was 215. It's also oh, important okay. to note that, on average, a stock car weighs about twice as much as an Indy car. Wow. NASCAR drivers are nothing like astronauts. I mean, <laughs> come on. Have you ever seen a NASCAR fly? Um. Hmm. In the race immediately corresponding with Bill Elliott's record-breaking qualifying lap, Bobby Allison would blow a tire in the trioval. The back of his car would lift off the ground and sail into the catch fence at nearly 200 miles per hour. Oh. It turns out that if you spin a car sideways at a fast enough speed, the aerodynamics will force the car aloft like the wing of an airplane. Yeah. In the 1987 Winston 500, the 210 mile per hour pace was enough to lift up Bobby Allison's 3,500 pound race car like a piece of paper. Damn. For a brief, surreal moment, all of NASCAR stood still. By pure chance, Allison's left front fender clipped the wall the instant before the back of his car hit the catch fence which redirected the momentum of his car away from the spectators. Bloody hell. Had Allison spun at just a slightly different angle, we could have witnessed a tragedy on the scale of the 1955 Le Mans disaster, where an out-of-control race car was projected into the stands at a very high speed. 83 spectators were killed in the catastrophe, leading many European nations to place a temporary ban on all motorsports. To this day, it remains the deadliest accident in racing history. Allison's car had sheared a 100-foot gap in the protective fencing, and NASCAR Gosh. fans found themselves staring into an eerie window of what could have happened. Miraculously, only five spectators were injured. And I don't no know what it killed. is, but like the seeing the actual footage and of what happened, just severed, like, and it could have ended NASCAR entirely. Just chills all over my body. NASCAR would make good use of their second chance as the era of speed came to a permanent end. This accident would force NASCAR to implement restrictor plates at all future super speedway races, which would limit the horsepower of all cars to keep them below dangerous speeds. This would profoundly change the way drivers raced at Daytona and Talladega. Gone okay. were the days of Bill Elliott making up five miles under green. Restrictor plates made it so that cars could no longer pull away from each other, instead emphasizing the attractive effects of slipstream. Simple racing moves such as passing were now drastically altered as timing and aerodynamics were now much more important than speed and handling. Yeah. Restrictor ate it all up. It, it made everybody the same speed, and that made it uh, probably more dangerous than, than when we were running 210. Naturally, many drivers were unhappy with this new change, and no driver hated restrictor plate racing more than Dale Earnhardt. As slow as all of us is running, they'll probably trouble everywhere. Which was a little odd, considering he was the best restrictor plate racer on the planet. <laughs> All for safety, but raceways have always been for high speeds. It's always been one of the fastest tracks in the US, and I think it took some of the glamour out of the Daytona 500. Okay, it's a fair point, but I mean, safety is safety. People had mixed opinions about when they were going to bring like the halo into F1, and now, and like all of the drivers, well, a lot of them were like, I hate it, it looks ugly, blah blah blah, and now it's coming to F1. They're all like thanking it so much because, you know, w without it, we'd be having some deadly crashes again. Um, so, I mean, I think every time you bring a new element into a sport, there's going to be mixed opinions. But I think once um, you actually see the results it gives, the opinions change. But I mean, you can understand why, like, if drivers have been 
driving a certain way for so long and then something drastically changes, they're going to have opinions about it. Just make it more dangerous. Hate restricted plate races. None of them are good. Wow. It was one of the most dominant runs of any race category. Yeah, in he was winning them history, all. And it happened during a time when NASCAR had arguably its toughest ever competition. Dale Earnhardt was dominating the competition. From 1990 to 1994, was. Dale Earnhardt would win four more cup championships, tying Richard Petty's record of seven, a <gasps> record considered by many to be untouchable just 10 years prior. With each new championship, it became harder and harder for people to disregard Earnhardt's success. Although many still resented his racing style, you can't win seven NASCAR championships without being a pretty talented driver. Earnhardt's detractors were simply running out of excuses to deny his greatness. Soon, there was only one thing keeping Dale out of the conversation for the greatest of all time. Now, have you, you've what not might that Daytona, be? Right? I've won Daytona, the firecracker race in July, but I haven't won the Daytona 500. That's like the Super Bowl race for us. Oh, God. After 17 years of effort, the Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waltrip. He's done it. In 1989, Daryl Waltrip won his first and only Daytona 500 in his 17th attempt. At the time, he was considered the best driver to never win it, and after he did, everyone was left to wonder about the next best driver to take Waltrip's place. Immediately, many thought of Dale Earnhardt, who had yet to win the Daytona 500 after 11 tries. But surely in 1990, while entering the final corner of the final lap in first place, after leading three quarters of the race, Earnhardt could put the narrative to rest. They still run single file, halfway down the back, straight away, half a lap to go. Still, Earnhardt now stretching his... Oh my god, there's something going to happen. Cope. The body can't do anything with Cope either. Earnhardt's car blows up! Earnhardt blows the tire in turn number three! And on the outside, it is car number ten. Derek Cope, something to miss on the... No way. Coming to the line, it's Labonte pulling up and an amazing finish! It's a curse. We've seen that curse. Charles Leclerc, he, he yeah, well, in his home race in Monaco, can't win any we of them. We run over some debris and cut a right rear tire down, David. Uh, just a uh, always crashing out. Always got a problem. That's what this is giving right now. In 1991, Earnhardt would damage his car after hitting a seagull, forcing him to pit. He would battle all the way back to second place before crashing with two laps to go. Oh. Dale Earnhardt fails to win the Daytona 500 again. All those frustrating years. After leading nearly a quarter of the race, Earnhardt runs second with 10 laps remaining. For Earnhardt, so close, so many times. So annoying. And it should have been his, and it wasn't. Deals a bad hand. I'm not sure I actually believe in curses, but Dale Earnhardt's misfortune in the Daytona 500 really made me consider it. For some wicked reason, the seven-time NASCAR champion and best super speedway racer in the world could not, for the life of him, win this one super speedway race. <laughs> Earnhardt's gut-wrenching futility at this one event is made even more insane when you consider that he's the winningest driver in the history of the track. No, seriously. By 1997, Earnhardt had won pretty much every stock car event at Daytona multiple times over, all except the one that mattered most. After 19 tries and 19 failures, he should have been completely discouraged. But Dale Earnhardt was not a quitting man. He wasn't even willing to quit this race. 1998 to wow. congratulate the man who has dominated everything there is to Imagine win in that. this sport. 20 race, years of trying to win day. that. They used to boo Dale Earnhardt when he was winning too much. That'll happen if you dominate any sport. But today, when they introduced the Intimidator, the crowd was full of cheers. <laughs> For all them race fans and all them people have been saying, Dale, this is your year. Dale, this is your year. And boy, a lot of them said it this year. The Daytona 500 is ours. We've won it. We've won it. We've won it. We won it. Bless. Checker flag, Dale Earnhardt 
Jr. is Texas Hall of Fame's second first time Winston Cup winner. While Dale Earnhardt never achieved his dream of racing alongside his father, he was able to race alongside his son. Dale Earnhardt Jr. made his full-time Winston Cup debut in 2000 under his father's own race team. Okay. Dale Jr. captured his first career win in just his 12th overall start, almost 21 years to the day of his father's first win. In victory lane that day, Dale Sr. appeared to take more pride in his son's accomplishment than any of his own. Racing with his son seemed to renew Dale Earnhardt's sense of purpose. Some would say that's all he ever really wanted, to race side by side with his own flesh and blood. And although the aging Earnhardt was nearing the end of his career, he would still make you think twice about questioning his greatness. <laughs> Runs 18, with five laps remaining. Wow, what comeback. Wow. That's a comeback story if I've ever seen one. No way! Within those five laps. That's crazy! Legend has it that Dale no was so good at restrictor plate racing because he could see the air coming off of the other cars and use this ability to perfectly time his passes. Dale Earnhardt's 76th and final career win came, fittingly, in a restrictor plate race at Talladega. Well, take a look at this moment. <gasps> that is Michael oh. Walsh out of control, tri-oval, into a series of sidewinders. Nine shattering snap rolls. I think all of you know what happens next. It was probably the only thing you knew about Dale Earnhardt. On one February afternoon, Dale Earnhardt would enter his black number three for the final time. Mm. I don't know because I didn't know who he was until I watched this, so I'm scared. Forty third Daytona five hundred. I'm scared. Welcome back to the It's all big one, gang. It's the big one. It's what we've all been fearing. This kind of racing is going to happen. A horrible crash on the back straightaway that began when Tony Stewart got turned sideways against oh. the back stretch wall number 20. Boy, and it gets hit by every car in the field, seems like, and Tony Stewart's car just took a whale of a ride. God help all of them because there's no place to go. <gasps> Incidentally, the crash would leave Dale Earnhardt in third position behind the DEI cars of Dale Jr. and Michael Waltrip. As the laps wound down, everyone began to realize that Dale Earnhardt wasn't trying to win the race. Rather, he was holding back the rest of the field so that his Should team could win instead. Own. Dale managed to hold off everybody until the final corner of the final lap. Three wide behind them. You got him, Mikey. You got him, man. You got him. You the Get him in the, the three cars out. Oh, big trouble. The cameras cut away from the accident. It should have been one of the happiest moments in NASCAR history, as Daryl Waltrip joyfully commentated his brother's first win on the grandest stage of all, a storybook ending to a picturesque day of thrilling, action-packed racing. And then the cameras cut to Dale Earnhardt's crumpled vehicle lying at rest in the infield grass. Nobody knew it at the time, but the greatest tragedy in NASCAR history had just occurred. Dale Earnhardt, NASCAR's greatest driver, was dead at 49. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, 
we've lost Dale Earnhardt. No. The official cause of death is listed as a basilar skull fracture sustained oh God, as a I'm crying. of blunt force trauma. When Dale Earnhardt struck the turn for a wall, he died instantly. Looking back on it all today, it's hard to believe it even happened. Dale Earnhardt was NASCAR's Iron Man, the toughest driver in the sport. He hadn't missed a race since his rookie season. He walked away from this and this. Why did he die from this? How did no one die from this crash earlier in the race? Well, at over 190 miles per hour, destinies can be profoundly altered by a matter of inches. NASCAR's greatest tragedy was avoided by inches, and NASCAR's greatest tragedy was caused by inches. In the lap 173 crash, Dale Earnhardt was just inches away from getting collected. Ironically, if Earnhardt had just been a little less fortunate here, it's likely that he would still be alive today. I remember him coming on there, and I can't remember if it's before or as soon as the wreck happened or during the, the red flag, but he said, Richard, if they don't do something to these cars, it's going to end up killing somebody. Dale Earnhardt was always aware of NASCAR's darkest secret. He just never imagined that he'd be the one reminding everyone of the truth. NASCAR is caked with the blood of dead drivers. The reason NASCAR was so compelling was because it was deadly. Obviously, no one actively wished death upon drivers, but it was mutually understood as an inherent risk of gliding around in a 3,500 pound hunk of metal at 190 miles per hour. Every few years or so, a driver would unexpectedly die in a race. Since the very beginning of the sport, this was the dark reality in the back of everyone's mind. You never wanted to see it happen, but when it did, you accepted it as inevitable and moved on. Dale's death was very different, though. Many That's racing so fans still haven't moved on. It was just too painful. The biggest icon in racing dying in the middle of the biggest event. Imagine if Michael Jordan died during the NBA Finals, or if Tom Brady died during the Super Bowl. This is what it felt like watching Dale Earnhardt die in the Daytona 500, and in my humble opinion, it's the single worst tragedy in the history of American sports. Even though Dale Earnhardt's death was a devastating shock for the millions of fans watching, you could at least take solace in knowing that he probably wouldn't have wanted to go out any other way. Dale Earnhardt died doing what he loved, and his final memory was watching his own drivers speeding towards the finish line with nothing but open racetrack in front of them. So I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> I think Dale Earnhardt is the best race driver that's ever been in a stock car. How do you feel about that? Well, yeah, that's a big statement. <laughs> I don't, you know, I think my dad was the greatest when, when it comes to racers. For as much as he accomplished, no one knew for sure if Dale ever felt he proved himself to his father. It's a burden he took to his grave, leaving us to wonder about Dale much in the same way Dale had to wonder about Ralph. The only thing we know for sure is that Dale finally caught up with his father's ghost. The story doesn't end here. Although NASCAR suffered perhaps its greatest ever loss, they still had 35 more races to run that season. When faced with their lowest moment, NASCAR had no other option but to push forward. Park has the run off the high side. He clears the body, and Steve Park scores the second straight win for Earnhardt Incorporated and the second win of his career. Boy, and that team, that company, Dale Earnhardt, the final win of Park's career. With an Earnhardt hat in his hand, oh. Steve Park will drive to victory lane. Scored his first career victory. Just his third cup start. A replay of a year ago with Dale Earnhardt and Bobby Labonte. Look at Kevin Harvick as the fans saluted Dale with the number three on the third lap. Kevin Harvick salutes him on the way to victory lane. If I was him, I'd run that thing out of gas right around here. What could be more fitting? What could be more special? Turns to Daytona. Okay. No. And 
with the most cathartic moment in NASCAR history, Dale Earnhardt Jr. would win at the track that took his father's life just five months earlier. For many fans, wow. this win was enough to heal the wounds from the tragedy of that year's Daytona 500. Some fans thought this finish was literally too good to be true, and that NASCAR rigged it. A compelling theory, until you consider the years of DEI restrictor plate dominance that followed. From 2001 through 2003, DEI carried the torch of Dale Earnhardt's restrictor plate prowess by winning 9 of the 12 Super Speedway events. In 2004, Dale Jr. would achieve what took his father 20 years by winning the Daytona 500 in just his fifth attempt. The legacy continues. Wow. Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins the 46th Daytona 500. Following the death of Dale Earnhardt, NASCAR would work to implement an unprecedented amount of driver safety improvements, most mm. notably the Hans device, Safer Barrier, and Car of Tomorrow, to make sure that an accident like Dale Earnhardt's could never happen again. Oh my god. Oh, it's, it's on fire. Oh my god. Incredibly hard impact. Look at, look, at that, look at that safer barrier right there, how it just crushed all that stuff. He look at that. that. Oh, look thank at that. Goodness. And he just and walked out of that the car. Fans. My goodness. And to this day, Mental. Dale Earnhardt still remains NASCAR's last fatality. <laughs> wow. Unfortunately, NASCAR's great strides in driver safety may be the only positive news for the sport in the past decade. Attendance, sponsorships, and television ratings have all drastically declined in the past 10 years, leaving the few remaining fans to wonder what exactly drove everyone away. Some people blame the recent mismanagement from Brian France and other NASCAR executives. Some people blame the chase and other gimmicks that have alienated NASCAR's core fanbase. Some people blame the lack of interesting or relatable drivers. Some people blame the recession and how it hit NASCAR's core audience the hardest, preventing them from going to races. If you ask me, however, the main reason so many fans stopped watching NASCAR is, ironically, because it got safer. As morbid as it is to say, by removing the inherent risk of racing, NASCAR removed the one thing that separated them from all other sports. Today, NASCAR drivers have never been farther from the snarling jaws of certain death, and the sport has been made far less compelling as a result. Not sure we're called going. Look at that, he's just running out of the car. Like nothing happened. <laughs> It's crazy when you see the comparison. We're all searching for the next Dale Earnhardt, but we know deep down that he's irreplaceable. Many fans consider Earnhardt That's the fair. greatest NASCAR driver of all time, possibly because we never got to see him decline. Dale Earnhardt remained one of the best drivers in the sport till the day he died, and even then, he still finished ahead of 30 other drivers. Cool. Because who could care about a bunch of cars going around in circles? NASCAR may Me. never be popular again. <laughs> Realistically, it probably should have never become popular in the first place. It's just a simple sport where no-name hillbillies gather to watch a bunch of fast cars race each other. But Dale Earnhardt made it mean more than that. And for as long as NASCAR sticks around, stock car racing fans will always remember the man in the black number three because there will never, ever be another driver like him. You got plenty of money. Don't need that to, to keep racing. Uh, is it worth the risk to keep on going? Sure, to win. Wow. I am speechless. <laughs> when I went through the comments uh, when I was reacting to the Netflix NASCAR series. I'm going to be honest, when someone said I should react to this and I found the video, I thought, oh god, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this or not. I do like learning about the history of like motorsports, but I was like, oh, it's, it's an hour long, I'm not sure if I'm going to enjoy this. I take back everything I was thinking. I have no words. That made me emotional. I cried. It was crazy to see like the actual footage to go along with it. 
learning like his the history and like they said he's he will never be replaceable <laughs> again i have no words i thoroughly enjoyed that um i'm looking forward to reacting to other things that you guys have suggested because yeah i haven't even watched a full season of nascar yet let alone i haven't even seen a full race yeah, and watching that has changed my whole outlook on NASCAR. Not that I had a bad outlook on it anyway, because I love racing and was so looking forward to watching NASCAR this year, but that has made me admire it even more. So saying that, I will definitely be going through the rest of everybody's suggestions. If you do have any more suggestions, please drop them in the comments. I would love to get through them all. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more reactions like this. If you want to check out any of my other socials, they are all linked in the description down below. I run a TikTok account that's all F123, Formula Academy, Formula E content, and I post on there like three times a day so if you wanted more like motorsport contents and i will definitely be posting nascar stuff on there now as well so if you wanted to see daily updates and stuff go give that a follow and i will catch you for the next reaction i'm so excited to do another reaction that's all from me today bye